Today we're going to fish the Wagler here at Decoy Lakes near Whittlesey. This water is very heavily stocked with carp and many other species. Much catches here often exceed 50 pounds. There's an awful lot of surface activity, fish just under the surface. In fact, there you are, look at that, that's a bream, that's a good sized bream there. Who knows, we, we may find that these fish, because of this warm weather, they could be in the surface area. But we're not going to know that until we actually start fishing. So I'm just going to position the gear here and then we'll get set up. First of all, what is a waggler? Well, basically, any float that is fastened at the bottom end only, that hangs loose on the line like that, that is termed a waggler. This one is a straight insert waggler. It's quite a long float, this one. It's about 12 inches long, because I know the water here is about 10 foot deep. And because of this wind, and I want to sink that line under the water, and of course, that is the advantage of a waggler. Because if you imagine that float when it's fishing, like that, my fingers representing the surface of the water, already you have attracted that line almost 12 inches underneath the surface. And the idea is, is to cast beyond the ground-baited area, put the rod tip under the, under the water, a few quick turns on the reel, and you will sink every inch of that line under the water. And therefore, the windier it is, provided you've got deep water, then use a longish float. The longish float gets that line under the water and stabilizes that float much, much quicker. Because it's warm and maybe one or two fish may come on the drop, then this inserted waggler being much finer, it's a peacock, just the same as the rest of the float. I'm a great believer in peacock. Peacock is the most robust float you can make a waggler out of. It's lovely and buoyant and very, very hard wearing. Will stand a lot of pressure. But this fine bit of peacock in, in this insert shows every little shot, the shot that I'm going to place down the line, it shows the settlement of every one of those shots until finally just the black or the red or whatever colour you're going to use tip is showing. I always like that little bit of white underneath because if a fish picks the bait up off the bottom and lifts that first number shot near us up, which will only be a small shot and yet big enough to let that float lift in the water and show me a lift bite. So it's always good to have a two-tone coloured tip, right, in that float. Well, let me just show you one or two other wagglers. This is the one we're using at the minute. These are red top ones. But of course, the big ones are for deeper water, where we're fishing in, say, 9, 10, 12 foot of water, sort of 6, 7, 8 foot of water, and 3, 4, 5 foot of water with a small one. So the size of the float relevant to the depth of water. And, of course, to a certain degree, distance. The bigger the float, the more loading you can get in the base of the float, which becomes your casting power, and the bigger the float, for the greater the distance. When you've really got to go a long way, that's when we use a bodied waggler. And we can't make the float longer and longer and longer. What we do then is put a balsa body on the base of the float. It keeps the float at a nice manageable length, but at the same time, that extra buoyancy that is required or that, that balsa body at the base gives it, allows you to put more weight at the base. In fact, this one, as you can see, is loaded with lead wire around the base just to give it that bit more casting distance. The other waggler, which I often use, is what I call the straight waggler. You can see here on this one, three different sizes again. You can have five, you can have as many sizes as you like. But the difference between this one and the first one, it isn't inserted. It is quite a, a thicker tip than the other one, because there are times when we have to lie so much line on the bottom, a thin tip float would drag under. And the reason why we lie that line on the bottom, and in fact shots on the bottom, is to try to slow the bait up. Because even though it's a still water, then the wind creates funny tricks. It moves the water around and uh, becomes a flow. In fact, I've seen some lakes actually run like rivers. And sometimes those fish want that bait slowed down, just like river fish do, if not stationary. And the only way you can do that is to keep increasing the depth and putting a small shot on the bottom and increasing the depth even more and putting another little shot on the bottom. I've seen times when I've had to fish nine foot deep in four foot of water before and laying little shots on the bottom before I've got the right stability, the right, got the float to go through at the right slowed down speed. The choice of reel when waggler fishing can either be the ordinary fixed spool reel with the open bale arm 
or what I'm tending to favour a lot more these days is the close face reel. What I find is if you've got a face wind like we've got today or even a cross wind, and this wind is a bit bluster, it's changing, one minute it's in my face, next minute it's across from right to left, then sometimes as the float hits the water as you cast, that surplus line can blow back down the rod and as you come to wind in that surplus line, already it has blown round the bail arm and you can get some almighty tangles round the bail arm, in fact resulting often in breaking the line off as you wind the line, the tangled line around that bail arm. And of course with the close face reel, you've got no bail arm at all. In fact all you've got is just those two pins that pick the line up and of course as you wind in, those pins just take the line in onto the spool. When you want to release the line to cast, it's just simply pr to press that centre button which releases the pins and therefore allows the line to peel off ever so easily. And of course, as it peels off so easy, therefore casting is made extra easy as well. But casting can be hampered by your decision on what diameter of line to use. And obviously the finer the line, the thinner the line, or the easier it is for that float to carry out on its way. And I always like to obey a rule that whatever the hook length is, then my real line, my main line, must be a shade strong. Now when I look at this particular water here, it's quite open water. It is true I have got some rushes and overhanging willow trees down that far bank, and should I hook any decent fish, I've no doubt they will head for those snags. But, so I'm a fair distance away from those snags, I should be able to control those fish on something like a pound and three quarter hook length. I may have to go to a two pound, I'll probably start with a pound at a tiny 20s or 22s even just to feel my way and then as, as I progress and find out that the fish are having a go I shall up the breaky strain and the size of the hook and hook length to suit. The hook I'm going to start with is a fine, fine wire maggot hook, it's the 90340 series. The size I'm going to use is a 19s, that's just well, it's a big 20s, and it's tied to a pound and a half. And so all you do with the hook length, you just form a loop, right, without actually tying it as such. Then take the, the real line, the main line, and thread that, and thread that through the loop to form two interlocking loops, but neither of them tied. And then simply then, with that finger and the thumb, just tw roll and therefore twist, put about five or six twists, and it gets twisted in both sides, if you look. And all you do then is thread that little end I've got in, in, in this hand through its own loop. Thread that through its own loop, get all of it there, and just pull it and see it tightening down to form the first half of the blood knot. Then turn to this half, get the short end of that, which is still already twisted, and thread that short end through its own loop. Grab it like that, and that series of twists then, sometimes it's best if you just wet them, in fact, because nylon can burn and therefore weak itself, and just by wetting it, it stops it from weakening, and that just twists down and tightens itself, and each knot, right, cushions on, or each one of each those revolutions, cushion onto each other, and form a very, very neat knot, that is, the double blood. The shotting pattern for the waggler is basically the same for all of them. The locking shot, which forms 90% of the, of the shot carrying capacity load on the float, in other words, it will take that float down to about there, leaving room for just the trimming shot down the line to sink the float down to the tip. Those shot want to be positioned right at the base of the float, and that is only three number fours. Don't let that kid you that that's all that float takes. It takes far more. In actual fact, there is a loaded insert let into that. That is a lead-loaded insert, perhaps about an inch and a half long, into the base of the float, which gives it its casting power. And notice also the locking shot, the actual two that shot that the float is locked in between. There's a little gap there. That is to let the hang line straight down so it's not lying, lying at an angle. I mean, if there was a lot of shot bunched up there, you had three or four shot bunched up there, it could affect the way the line was hanging. 
But that way, and especially with the little swivels I use, the float is very loose on the line, which is important when you strike. The actual float collapses on the line, and it's a straight through action from rod tip right to fish. Now, I haven't put any more shot down the line as yet, because what I want to show you is how to plumb the depth. If I just drop this float in the water as it is, just to show you how it is loaded at this point, that's without any further shot on the line, let's just drop it out there, just so see how it stands. All right? As you can see, there's a good two inches, in fact, the total antenna, right, the insert, is protruding out of the water. Therefore, if I put a swan shot on the hook, and cast it out, which I can cast a swan shot with ease. You can't cast a big three-eighths of an ounce plummet out with ease on the end of a float. It tends to go out like a pair of bolasses that the Argentinas use for knocking the cattle down. It tangles easily. Just a swan shot, you'll be able to put it out there quite easily. Swan shot is capable of sinking that float if the depth that you've set it at isn't deep enough. So you can actually plumb the depth by just placing a swan shot just get a swan shot out of here. And all you have to do is just squeeze it on the hook, or just above the hook. Oh, it's just gently squeeze it just on the hook like that. And I can actually use that plummet as a, as a or that swan shot as a plummet. Now then. What I'm going to look for now is the bottom of the shelf. And from past experience here, I know that the shelf is about, just about two and a half rod lengths out. So all you've got to do now is, in search of that shelf, cast it out about two and a half rod lengths out. Swan shot is searching its way down to the bottom and it sank the float. That means that we're not set deep enough. I set that tattle at about ten foot deep and uh, it's pulled the float under. It looks like I'm going to go just have to go a little bit deeper. I don't think I'm that far. Only if I, I just pull the float back a bit. Let's just try there. Float's gone under. Oh no, and there it is. There it is. The float has now come back. So just by pulling the float in that couple of yards, the float has now popped up out of the water, proving now that the swan shot is on the bottom. So that is probably on the shelf or very close to the bottom of the shelf. And I was probably just a little bit off the bottom, just being that bit farther out where it was just that little bit deeper. What it means, in actual fact, I've got to increase the depth just a few more inches to put the hook on the bottom. But with a view to actually lying on the bottom and presenting a still bait, I'm going to actually go about a foot deeper. So I'm going to have about nine inches to 10 inches of line, perhaps, actually on the bottom, simply just by sliding the shot up the line, just about a foot, and lay about a foot of line, therefore, on the bottom. Shotting patterns are designed for two reasons in mind. One, obviously, is to attract the fish as we're firing free offerings of bait in. As that bait falls, we expect to catch fish on the drop. But also, therefore, our shutting pattern is to actually try to copy that same rate of fall as our free offerings. And the other reason that people don't often talk about is tangles, the anti-tangle shutting pattern. And really, if you obey this rule, then, or the rule that I'm going to show is I put the small shot on the line, and providing you feather the line on the cast, you should never, ever get any more tangles. Well, very few anyway. I'm not going to say ever, any, ever, any more. The first shot, that little tens there, wants to go about 14 inches from the hook. In other words, because we're laying on the bottom about 12 inches, we've positioned that little tiny shot just a couple of inches off the bottom. If the bait's not stable, if the float's moving, we can always, as I said before, increase the depth, put that shot on the bottom to act as a little anchor, therefore slow our presentation up. If that doesn't work, we can even go deeper again and put the next shot, right, which is a number eight, and we can put that on the bottom. But let's get this shotting pattern right first. 12 inches, or 14 inches from the hook to the first shot, which is that number 10. The next shot, slightly bigger, which is a number eight, 
and the distance, distance between hook and shot, double that over the line, if you like. And you can see that the hook falls short, right, of the next shot. In other words, as you increase the size of the shot, then increase the size of the pitch. The next shot, from a 10 to an 8, should be, in reality, a 6, slightly bigger. But instead of using a 6, I prefer to use multiples of shots. I think they lie on the line much neater. And I've used two number 8s. And once again, the distance between the last number 8 and those two number 8 is greater than that number 8 and the number 10. Increase the pitch, increase the size of the shot, and you'll get very, very few tangles right in casting. Well, all we've got left to do now is to mix the ground bait. Because there are a fair head of, well, a good head of carp in here, and because we're fishing a lake, then I'm going to actually use a ground bait which is designed for lake fishing. But I'm going to make one or two additives to it in the form of hemp seed, this stuff here. Absolutely brilliant stuff. It's sort of an oily seed, and when the ball of ground bait gets to the bottom, it get, the oil escapes and therefore sends a column of particles fizzing in the water. There's another little additive, brasm, which almost says bream, and that's what it's expe exceptionally good for. It. But the base of my mix today is going to be this 3000 Lake Mix. It's a, a French mix. That's what I'm going to use. I'm going to put the actual ground bait through the sieve first, and that was sort of a kilo. This is a kilo bag of the actual hemp. I'm only going to use just about a third of a bag of that. Put that through the sieve as well. And then, this very, very fine brasm, not much of this, just a, a sprinkling, just to give it a little bit of flavour. And believe you me, it just seemed to do the trick. Mix all that together, right dry, in the dry, in the dry form. And a lot of people make the mistake of trying to mix this up in a deep bucket. They're the people I call the bucket brigade. The right way, the only way to mix ground bait is to actually add the water to the ground bait, little by little, and with your fingers well spanned, stir it round and round quite vigorously, distributing the water, just a little here, there and everywhere, and mix it round until you feel that ground bait starting to bind together. And that's it, I can feel it binding now. Once you feel that, get two hands in it, turn it over and fluff it up, try and get as much air into the ground bait, make it as fluffy as possible, that's the idea. And the quality of a good ground bait is a ground bait that you can squeeze, make a ball, throw it the distance, or catapult it the distance if you're fishing a long way out, without it breaking in mid-air. And yet, at the same time, once that ground bait hits the bottom, it breaks back up into a dust very, very quickly. And of course, with all these ground hemp particles in it, and other particles that are already in this 3000 lake, you do get this column of activity. In fact, sometimes the water starts to fizz, and the fish move in into that column, whatever depth they're at at the time. Quite often, they will follow it down to the bottom. But on a day like today, I've still got a strong feeling that these fish are going to be more on the surface than what they are on the bottom. But nevertheless, I'm going to try and force them down to get the head stuck into this on the deck. Now, what I watch the Continentals do to improve this already good ground bait as it is now, is actually inject more air into it. That's simply by just putting the ground bait on a sieve, putting the whole now wetted ground bait through the sieve. And that takes any lumps out, injects more air into it, and makes the ground bait into a real fluffy texture. It doesn't take many, many minutes to do it. You do get one or two lumps left this time. Don't throw those away. Those are just collected more water than the rest. Just smooth those out, pushing them through the sieve. And there's the ground bait ready. You can see now what a nice fluffy texture that is. You can actually see the hemp seed in it. In actual fact, I've got some proper hemp that I'm just going to add to it. That's the hemp seed that's been soaked overnight 
and then just boiled, brought to the boiling point, and then simmered until you see it actually split and the white kernels start to appear. Once that's done, turn the stove off and let it cool down. In fact, when it's cooled down, just rinse it through and wash it, and uh, that's it. And especially in this summer time, right in this warm, when the waters are warm, then they do hemp does seem to hold the fish there. So. I'm going to loose feed some, but I'm just going to put a taste of it, just a nice handful of it, actually in this initial ground baiting, because the way I look at it, this initial ground bait is really as a bit of fuss in the water, a bit of colour in the water, particles floating up and down, to instantly attract fish. And usually, it's small fish that arrive first, perhaps little roach, the odd better roach, the odd rud, things like that. And as they move into that cloud, and you can catch those with a maggot, uh, because I'm going to put some squats in, right, which is the little house fly, handful of those, because they'll end up on the bottom, and that's also another little tiny particle feed, which will hold fish. And because there's skimmer bream in here, in fact, all fish will eat the squat, but once again, it's a good holding bait. But once those little fish move in first, I think what happens is then, the bigger fish are attracted just simply by the small fish feeding. I find that casters, right, loose fed over the top of that ground bait, eventually brings those big fish. You start to catch little fish immediately after the bombardment, and maybe catch those for half an hour, or an hour, or whatever. There's always that telltale sign of those big fish moving in. That is when the little fish cease to bite. So, a good handful of those casters. So we've got castor squats and, and hemp, right, as well as the, the grilled hemp uh, in that ground bait now, and that is ready for throwing in. I'm going to put in about eight balls, but the actual place, the actual placing of the balls is, of course, very, very important. We've already decided where the bottom of the shelf is, about two and a half rod lengths out, when we plumb the depth, but also the distance or direction uh, is important because once these balls are in then of course I've got to continually keep fishing over that exact spot for the rest of the day and of course in two or three hours from now I've got to still know exactly where those balls of ground bait are so by picking a far bank feature and use as a marker in fact when I look across across the other side I've got a nice little sandy bank there in fact the gap between the trees throws a lovely white tunnel uh, and it's in the middle of that tunnel that I'm actually going to place these balls of ground bait right at the bottom of that shelf, about two and a half rod lengths out. You see, feeding fish, they patrol the bottom of these shelves where the shelf finishes and the flat starts. Those fish patrol the bottom of those shelves and it's there where I'm going to pinpoint this ground bait. So make about, I would think, on a day like this when on such a prolific water that eight balls isn't going to be out of the question at all. Underhand throw and put those balls just one on top of the other right at the bottom of that shelf and right in the middle of that white corridor of water we've got there. What we're trying to do in actual fact is force those fish to actually get their heads down on this feed. Right, I'm going to use on the hook, on that little tiny 20s maggot hook, I'm going to use a red maggot. I'm a great believer in playing the minority game. I've just filled the swim with eight balls of ground bait lace with casters and squats, little tiny maggot. Not a single red maggot has gone in there. Mine's going to be the only one down there, and hopefully it'll be snaffled up quick. I'll put a bait on, but what I want to show you next before we get fishing seriously is the actual casting technique. Now, we talked about the shotting pattern just as regards tangle-free shotting pattern. It's only tangle-free, provided you learn to feather the line. Now, the easiest way to cast and get true direction is what I call the 6 o'clock till 12 o'clock. In other words, 
from 6 o'clock straight behind you to 12 o'clock, then the floater's got to follow that same plane. Therefore, direction, provided you point the rod from 6 till 12 in that direction, then the floater's got to go in that direction, right up that white corridor of shadow that we've got there. Feather in the line, well, what you do, you elevate the float, send the float perhaps higher than what it should be or what you think it should be, and as the float is landing and the line is trickling off the reel, just by applying your finger to the rim of the reel and slowing the line down as it comes off the reel, it will slow the float's entry and the three shot and the hook will pass the float and on a calmish day, you can actually see those shot dimple, dimple, dimple beyond the float and finally the hook. And that gives you the confidence that everything has landed in a nice straight line. Your bait is going to flutter down in a very tempting, menacing way, just like the free offerings that we're also going to be putting in as well, because we're going to actually be feeding casters with the catapult whilst we're fishing. This cast, like I was saying, stand up, it makes it easy for yourself. Swing then the whole tattle behind, let it hang there, then go forward, and like I said, everything goes in a straight line. Once the float has hit, after feathering the line and throwing the hook forward, once it's hit, don't pause, immediately stick that rod end under the water, and you can see that line already in a bow because I have paused, and a few quick turns, that sinks that line completely under the water. My float to where I'm sat here is completely, is exactly in the middle of that corridor, right over that ground-baited area. All I was left to do now is just to put a few, a little bite, just to put a few casters in over the top of that on a little and often principle, virtually with every cast, just a dozen or so casters, and we should soon be in business. Or it may even mean shallowing right up because there is an awful lot of surface activity. Quite often what you find is the little fish are down below and the big fish are on the top. Absolutely the reverse to winter time when the big fish are all down there on the deck. There we are, there's the first, there's the first fish. Now, as I suspected, I think it's probably a little roach. There we go. In fact, quite a nice little roach. I wouldn't mind these coming all day. There's a nice roach, about four or five ounce. I thought the fish were going to be much, much smaller than that. That's not a bad stamp at all. Cast again. Bring the tackle behind you, six till 12, directional, straight down the, the channel. Sink the line. And there's the float right over the ground baited area again. Good inch and a half of the float sticking up and as each shot settles and the float just drops each time there was a bite on the drop that's a bigger fish now, there you go you see i'm looking for those little fish and all of a sudden it's a bigger fish that's taking it on the drop not the sort of big fish that i was anticipating in the form of carp and bream and possibly tench but I think this is a, a rud, I'm not sure. No, it's a, it's a little carp. That was the took it as that bait, even though I'm fishing the bottom, I the bait had only fallen about three or four foot down before that fish actually took it. And it's just like I said earlier, even though I've put that ground bait in to get those fish down on the bottom, when I arrived here first thing and saw those fish just under the surface and the hot weather that we'd had just recently, then I suspected that this could have been the case. I think he's now just placed the net, not in the water, but close to the water, ready to and bring that carp or that fish actually to the net. A big fish, but they really fit as tigers. These eyes got to be a pound, pound six, something like that. Try and get his head up. You can see now this little tiny hook and fine line, just a pound line. 
We just look up at the top of the rod there. This rod's a lovely rod. It's a very, very soft action, and therefore it cushions the lunges of these fish, especially underneath the rod end. Any rod will cope with a fish pulling when it's out at distance. But when it's under the rod end and the rod end is bent right over, that's when you've got to have a good rod, something that doesn't pull the hook out of the fish's mouth. There we are, keep his head up into the net and he's mine. Slide the net towards you. Just sit on the butt of the rod like that. Ah, would you believe that one? Just cough the hook out, just as, as I, I lifted it out of the net. Hook came out of its mouth, landed in the net. That's what you call catching that one in the nick of time. Just try another red maggot, but he was a stranger in the camp. I think he was a little bit of an early bird. I think really what we should be catching still is these little roach to start with. Unless these carp have moved in, unless they're really going to have a go today and they've moved in earlier than what I expected. But well, normally with this method, these little fish, they continue to feed usually for about an hour before the actual carp take over. I'm saying that one was a little bit of an early bird. Uh, he was due long before his time. But maybe the conditions are just spot on for them. And um, who knows, we might have been into the bigger fish right away. Here's one. This feels like another one of those little roach. Just measure the line and swing it right into your hand. A little tiny hook comes out ever so easy. And just put it nicely in the net. There's another fish on. This one feels a bit bigger. This is a little bit better roach. You see, that took it exactly the same as the last one on the drop. In fact, I reckon that one hadn't fallen four foot. Oh, it's a rud. See the lovely golden flanks on that and the bright red fins. He's just a bit bigger. I'm going to have to net him. There you go. Much deeper bodied than a roach. In actual fact, the rud's a surface feeding fish. And if you look, you see his top lip. I'll just take the hook out first. Come on, you beauty. You can see that his top lip, right, he's back from the bottom lip. And therefore, he's almost, his lips are facing to the surface. I'll show you that he is a surface feeding fish. We just look at the blood red fins. The golden body, much deeper fish than a, than a roach. On a water like this that's so prolific with big fish, there's one bait I wouldn't be without, and that is, of course, the caster. I mean, I've actually prepared these myself, and it's easy. And when I have prepared them myself, I'm full of confidence that I know the bait's right. I'd never rely on casters prepared by anybody else, because I don't know how long they've had them in the fridge, and... I'm always a great believer on the casters have to be fresh, they have to be turned right in proper damp sawdust. It's really quite an easy operation. In fact, if you like, let's go back to my house now and I'll show you exactly how to turn them. And that, knowing you've got that fresh bait, will breed a confidence in you that you know that you can rely on your bait and if you're not catching fish, then it's up to you to alter your method. One thing you can't blame is the bait once you've done it in the right manner. The secret to turning good casters relies on three things. First, the quality of the maggots that you buy as fresh maggots have got to be of the best quality. And secondly, looking after them means putting them in a constant temperature. About 50 degrees is ideal. If you can find a room, a cellar, a dampish cellar is the ideal thing. And the other thing is to keep the sawdust as damp as possible. Not too wet, otherwise you'll have the maggots running everywhere. I've just brought these from a gallon of maggots from the local tattle shop. You can see just how fresh they are with the little black feed spots in them. 
The first thing to do is to get rid of the sawdust that they came in, because the sawdust they come in could be rough, and the thing I like to do is to turn these casters in, in a very, very fine sawdust. In fact, this sawdust here, I've had it for years, and you can see it's a lovely, fine texture. First thing to do is to get rid of the sawdust that it came, these maggots came from, from the tattle show. There's all sorts of lumps of bits of timber in there and everything. And the easiest way to do that is pour them just a few at a time onto a sieve, shake them like that, which shakes all the sawdust, all that rough stuff through, and then empty the maggots into a new container. And what you end up with is a gallon of maggots absolutely free from sawdust. And now just bed them down in the fine sawdust, which I've just shown you. Simply just pour them in there. And the shallower you can keep these, it's no tr good trying to cast maggots in a deep bucket. The shallower, the shallower tray you can get, in other words, they don't get hot, right? They cast better. If they start to get hot, then they start to bend and you end up with banana-shaped casters. But where they're in a nice, cool environment and left to cast over the week, in other words, buy your casting maggots on the Monday, and they should be, those as fresh maggots on the Monday, and then they'll be ready, they'll turn into casters on Thursday night and Friday morning, ready for the weekend. Once those have all bedded down in that sawdust, the other thing which I find helps enormously, and that is just to keep, and I mean daily, that sawdust damp. And all I do is just pour a little bit of water just into the centre, like I said, not too much, because if you get the maggots too wet, then obviously they'll start climbing up the side and they'll escape. No need to mix that sawdust. The maggots will mix that dampness into the sawdust themselves. Well, Thursday night, I went and had a look at the, at the maggots and they were just starting to cast. So I put those on the riddle and run them through and there was a, just a mere handful of casters and a handful of skins. That's the maggots that have died through the week and uh, I just discarded the lot totally. All I've got to do now is pour these onto the sieve, shake the sawdust through, and then maggots, because they don't like the light, will dive their way through the mesh back into the sawdust in the bottom of the tray, leaving the casters on top of the sieve. And just shake those into one corner and into the water. Now, all we have to do now is just get rid of that water and run the remainder of those maggots which are still wriggling, which at the moment are underwater. And that's ever so easy to do. Just empty the water and its contents through the sieve. Spread those out. And the odd wriggling maggot that is there in that, shake the surplus water. I don't mind a little bit of water going on this sawdust because I'm still going to maintain the sawdust in the majority of the maggots, still going to maintain it slightly damp. So if it drips into there a little bit, I don't mind. But the thing is now, the important thing is, any wriggling maggot that is still in this tray, I want it through that sieve, through that mesh and into the sawdust. Because if I try to submerge all that lot under water and keep them under water, then those wriggling maggots never ever turn to casters and end up as skins and are off put into the fish. So it's now just a matter of leaving those. I can leave those now for an hour, an hour and a half, and they'll all catch one another up in colour. And that's then how I would bag them up and ready for the match on Saturday. And a couple of hours later, depending on the temperature, in the winter time, it takes a little longer. In the summer time, perhaps only an hour. Then they will have all have matured to a, a rich red colour, just like these have here. Now, a lot of people say, "Well, those are going to float." They won't. What they are, they're lovely, deep red, crispy shells. It means you can actually bury a hook in them so easy. There's nothing worse than getting a soft caster and trying to bury the hook. The caster just disintegrates in your fingers. Just going to shake those down now and put them into a a pot of water, and you should see that every one of those, every one, well, maybe three or four have just floated, and you're going to get that anyway. Just pour that little bit of water off them, and there you are, sort of a pint and a half of good, fresh, 
crispy casters. Well, whilst you've all been looking out to prepare casters, I've been busy here, and virtually it's been a fisher cast. But the little roach just seem to have disappeared now. Now, I expected this was going to happen. It's, no, it's the normal thing. Because the bites have now eased up on that red maggot, I've actually changed the hook to a 16s, changed from a pound line to a pound seven hook length, and the bait now is double caster, and I'm looking for those bigger species. Let's see how we go on. One of the reasons why I actually chose this peg is because with the wind blowing into this corner, often that is the best area to fish. You know, look for the wind blowing into that bank. And fishing sort of diagonally across this corner, then I can pull fish from all around these margins. Not just the margins at the bottom of this shelf, but there's also another shelf that falls across from that bank. And fishing, I'm virtually fishing in the corner of two shelves. And it's got to be a good peg on the day. Whilst I'm laying on with that double caster, I haven't had a sign with it yet. But all I can do is just keep putting just a couple of dozen casters right on that same area. Keep those casters going in just on a, a little and often sort of principle. There's a little sign now. Yes, we're in. This is a better fish. This is probably a carp or the double caster there. And he's just hugging the bottom. This feels a nice fish. And he's taking a bit of line. They're ever such a slow fish. It's not really running off like a carp. Might even be one of those big bream. The bream in here, they run to sort of five and six pounds. This one's being quite slow and heavy. It's not as active as the old carp. I'm going to gamble on a bream for this one. You know, that's another thing. See that thump of its head then on that rod end. Oh, it's coming to life now. Come on. Oh, it looks like a tench. It's a tench. Oh, would you believe it? There's not that many tensions. They grow to six pounds. I don't think it was that quite that big, but quite pleased to have a tension. Let's just take our time with this a bit. Look at it boil under the surface there. Let's see. Just get his head up. Look, okay, we don't have any tattle all laid out right around here. My net was a mile away then. Let's look at those boils there. Come on, just coax its head up. Really give it a good account. That's it. That's it, just keep his head up now, we've got it up. That is mine. What a beauty, how about that? There, yeah, I just showed you that double caster trick has worked. And the number of times it has worked for me is unbelievable. Well, that's a beautiful fish. That's got to be, well, I suppose it's got to be getting on four pounds. That's a real cracker. Lovely fish in good condition. You know, they, let me just take the hook out. Well, they call this fish, the tench, they call it the doctor fish because they reckon that any fish that's unwell, got a little bit of a mark on it or anything, they rub up against this fish, the tench, the old doctor fish, and transfer some of the slime off this fish onto their own body, and it's supposed to have healing powers. Did you see that then, as I fired those casters in, right, there were swirls beneath the surface. And I'm just going to give this method on the bottom just a couple more minutes and then I'm going to have to change and cut there and fish shallow because I'm now convinced that the majority of the fish are up there. In fact, I thought it right from the word go as soon as I arrived here and saw all the surface activity. Oh, there you are. This is a decent fish as well. Oh, this is a good fish. This is a good fish. The thing is, no, don't wind them in as such, just sort of wind the rod. Lower the rod as you wind it. I'm taking line all the time, but it's the rod that's soaking up. And then pull that fish towards you. Use the rod tip. And see, I'm just coaxing it like a little dog on a lead, just bringing it in towards me. Oh, it is. It's a lovely tench again. Bigger than the last one. It certainly looks it at the minute. 
Oh, look at the power in that dorsal fin. What a lovely fish this one is. If the other one was shorter four pound, then this one certainly is four. Oh, could it bend that rod? Good <laughs> power in that tail as well, that tail and that. Look at that roll over, don't roll on my line. I hate that when they actually roll over on the line, you can feel the, the fins actually on the line. That's the worst thing there is for pulling. Look at just try and coax his head up, and I mean coax, you can't yank a fish's head this size up. Come on. Come on this time, you beauty. Come on. Oh, that's it. Keep his head up and keep his head up. Tore him in towards you. And you must have saw that net then, I reckon. That's what I'm looking for. Head up. That's it. I've got you. He's mine. Well, yeah, that's another cracking tench. You see, I've never known this many tench actually come out of this one. It's usually carp, 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 bream. But what I, I think it is, it's like I keep saying, I reckon that all them carp are up on the top. It's true, I have had a couple of carp on the bottom, I know. But two tench is fairly unusual in such a short time. I can imagine what's happening is the tench is staying down there on the bottom. Look at that for a fish. I reckon the tench is staying is the only fish that's finding that food, any of the food that's reaching the bottom. I reckon that it, once we shallow up, put that smaller float on, then I think we'll be in the, into business with the carp. I'm going to rig up with a very, very short waggler and fish very, very shallow, maybe 18 inches deep or even shallower. I'll have to find the depth by trial and error and then it'll just be a matter of loose feeding maggots. And I'm going to actually wet one or two of the maggots. In fact, what I do, I use this sort of container here, just an ordinary maggot pot with the actual lid cut out, put a bit of water in it, just a little bit of water and get your maggots And on this method, in five hours, it's easy enough to use a gallon of maggots. And just put a, a good handful of those in that water. Now, I don't know whether you've ever had the experience where it's actually rained on your maggots, and when you've thrown them in, you've noticed that the majority of them have floated. Well, that's exactly what we want to do. But of course, wet maggots, they'll crawl out of most things. And that's why this particular design of maggot tin with the middle cut out, this, this ridge, stops them from escaping. Right, the float I'm going to use is this little beauty here, this little 4BB peacock waggler. It's a homemade job. It's sort of peacock, an insert peacock, and an insert peacock again. Little short float, about four and a half, five inches long. It takes 4BB, and uh, because of the way it's, it's manufactured, it's been made, uh, a treble taper, if you like, then it really flies through the air. As small as it is, when we take it 4BB, we'll be able to put it easily in the same place of where we've been regularly feeding those casters whilst we're fishing with that longer float to beat the drift uh, and fishing on the bottom. With the same reel line, the two, two and a half pound or 2.8 reel line, I'm going to go for a pound and three quarter hook length. But this time, instead of the 90340, you know, the orangey packet or the orangey logo, I'm going to go for the yellow one, which is the a much heavier maggot, heavier uh, hook, designed for the maggot, but a str much stronger hook, and certainly designed for these hard-fighting carp. The number of that, by the way, is 90342, and it's become one of my favourites, especially for this type of fishing. I'm going to go for a single maggot to start with. Let's go for a single red, and I'm going to feed continually as you can see, if you look out there now, towards my white stripe, there's no sign of fish at all. But the minute I cast out there, not the minute I cast out there, the minute I start to feed out there, especially with the odd floater, right, in, I reckon those fish will be into them in quick sticks. All they do now is just keep an eye On the end of my rod, my rod is virtually a quiver tip, and I just continually just put a few maggots onto that area. A few of those dry ones, not forgetting a few of these wet ones. In actual fact, by now, 
this one or two of them should be actually floating. But just drop some in the side here. Just drop a few in the side, and there you can actually see. You see, there's probably about 25% of those maggots, maybe 30% of those maggots are floating. Oh, see the line tight up. As soon as that bait hit the water, we're into one. Now look at that one go. That's really bending that rod end. That line's singing through, wind singing through the line. As soon as the float hit the water, that fish was waiting for that maggot. I only wish I could feed out there now whilst I was playing that one and keep the rest of them there. Like I say, it's pretty open water here. But these carp, they can get quite powerful. And uh, there's carp and carp, there's some decide to just go round and round in circles. Con, I really am giving that some stick now. I mean, look at that rod bend. Wind down to it, and then sort of pump it up. Right, there we go. Here he comes. Oh, look at that, it's a beauty. Now, this one's a mirror carp. All right, the last one we had was a, a common carp, which was fully scaled. This one's a mirror. Now just look at this. Just don't want to pull that hook out of his mouth. But I have got an awful lot of confidence in these hooks. I've been, I've won quite a few matches on these cart waters just lately. In fact, I won a three hour match uh, with 81 pound just the other week on these hooks and uh, that certainly gave me an awful lot of confidence. Once again, bring that fish to the net. Get his head up again. They are fit. This, without doubt, is the fishing of the future because the state the rivers are getting in these days and the pollution and they're fishing worse and worse and worse. These little landlocked fisheries stuck with carp, then, without doubt, this is... If I was to take a young, a young chap fishing, then this is the sort of place I'd have to bring him because every fish you catch is fun. They're not monster carp at two and three and four pound, but every one you get gives a real good, <laughs> a real good account of itself. Come on, come on this time. There you are. That one's going to be two and a half, I suppose. But let me just show you. Where the other one was fully scaled, that was a common carp, this one has just got the odd, odd, odd big scales, these big scales here. And consequently, that gets its name, the mirror carp. Let's get that hook out of its mouth. Yeah, this is just lightly hooked in the corner of its mouth there. Lovely full tail on it. Beautiful conditioned carp. Yeah, mirror carp. Put the rod there. Just watch. Oh, that rod end went round again. Before I could put the rod down, that rod end went round. It's just a matter of continually feeding. Oh, this isn't a carp. This looks like a rud to me. Nevertheless, a nice fish. Is it a rud? Yeah, it's a rud. Another rud of six or eight, six or eight ounce. Lovely fish. Getting a bit confident now. We've got the right method now, and you can always tell when I've got confidence when I start lifting those sort of fish out. I know we're going to bag up, as they say. So it just shows you. It just shows you fishing on the bottom, you know, the traditional method of plumbing the depth, it's not always the case. And because of today's climatic conditions, you might say, because of this warm weather, not just today that we've had for a while, then our first observations when we arrived here were obviously right, where we could see all that surface activity from all those fish. I can see them. They're like black sharks out there now, just waiting for the next pouch full of maggots coming in. Just look at them. It's, all, it's almost the saying, I'll open my mouth, just fire it in. There it goes. Oh. Yeah, look at that one go. I don't think this one's a big one, but certainly another one put in a good account, but it did. Look 
Oh, little baby carp. But he's welcome. If I'd have lost that in the first three seconds, I'd have said it was four pound. It shot off like a like a real good and it did. After all, it's only about 12 ounce. Well, maybe a pound. Ever so thick across its bike. There we are, that's a common again, see? Fully scaled, big long dorsal fin right the way down its back, look. There you are, there's the right end going round again, and it's on. There you go, give swirl to the surface already. Whoa, come on, me beauty. Well, this has been hectic. Oh, that's what I like. The line's wrapping round, is it? No, no, that's it. A wallow with this one. I think we're going to finish the last fish of the day, I think. It's going to be one that wallows on the top. <laughs> this is giving a real poor account of itself. And it's a good fish as well. <laughs> but he's still... Oh. That'll do you. That'll do you. In mine. Oh, come out. And you know, the hook has just pulled out of that. It's so soft in the mouth, these carp. They are, that's a common carp as well. There you are, look, beautiful fish. And I think they're only a, just a couple of years old. If you imagine next year and the year after, then uh, I think we'll have to strengthen our gear up a little bit to be able to cope with them. But nevertheless, beautiful fish, beautiful condition. Let's put him back in there. Well, I think, all methods have been proved. I think all we've got to do now is just, let's have a catch pitch. Let's see what our total weight is in there. You know, another thing about this fishery as well, that every angler who visits here is supplied with a keep net and a landing net on the day. Because the owners are very, very strict about conservation. And they don't want disease to spread from one, one lake to another. And I think it's a brilliant idea. They've actually got these conservation keep nets with this lovely soft material in the bottom. And when you come to empty your fish back, in actual fact, what you do, you turn the net inside out up to that layer there, right? And the fish aren't harmed at all. But, oh, but we've had quite a good day. I would like to say what weight there is, but there's certainly over a hundred pound there. I mean, there is a net full of carp and two cracking tench. Let's get them back in the water pretty quick. But well, that is one hell of a catch. Well, I think that well and truly proved that the method worked. But at the same time, also proved that you mustn't be stereotyped with any of your methods. You must learn to read the water, read and understand what's happening as you feed and as you present your bait. Well, I've certainly enjoyed making this program. It's been a real pleasant day. All I can say is I hope you've enjoyed it, and until next time, tight lines. Thank you.